kill the world. Okay, so uh, what did we learn in the first couple hours? Uh, we learned what a random measure is. It's a stochastic process indexed by a collection of subsets. Uh, we learned a particular way to construct a random measure with stick breaking, um, a recursive scheme. Um, more generally, one talks about size bias sampling. Um, stick breaking is a particular example of that. Um, and then we learned there's various marginalizations where you get rid of some of the underlying probability structure and things see the combinatorics. The Chinese restaurant process is a combinatorial object, a distribution on, on uh, partitions. Um, okay, so let's see a little bit more of the connections. I want to do one kind of last one. Um, uh, so I had this diagram here that kind of organizes our thinking. We have these random measures that are formed as sums of atoms. And um, we learned how to get things like polia and um, um, Chinese restaurant process out of that. And then we're going to be going up to completely random measures here. Um, so one more connection then is perhaps, what if I were to start with polia? Is there a way to kind of to get to the stick breaking perspective? We kind of went the other way around. Um, and so, uh, so there is. Um, so um, let's remember the Chinese restaurant process. I've got people coming in and sitting at these tables and so on. Um, so let's imagine a, um, a special case of a uh, polya urn um, where uh, uh, you only have two uh, binary polya urn, you have two, two values, okay? So a one is going to mean that you sit at the first table in a Chinese restaurant, and a zero is going to mean you sit at any other table. We're going to binarize this situation, okay? So the first person sits here with probability one, so let's forget about that. All right, so let's think about the second person on. Okay, second person on. Um, so second person sits here or, or not. And um, so let's let zi be indicators denoting um, from the second person on. Okay, what, which, whether you sit at the first table or not. Those two possibilities. Okay, and let's consider the probability that everybody sits at the first table. So z1 is equal to one, z2 is equal to one, dot, dot, dot. Uh, zn is equal to one, so up to some n. Okay, um, all right. So that's just by our you know, calculations earlier. Um, uh, Z1 sits there with probably proportional to one because there's already one person sitting there, the initial person, uh, and then alpha plus one, and then two alpha plus two, you know, dot, 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 up to n alpha plus n. Okay, and you don't have to know a lot of combinatorics to know that that numerator is gamma of n plus one, and then downstairs is just the uh, increasing Factorial. Right, there's a little formula then for a particular probability. Mn minus one. Um, okay, I've got n plus one in my notes. Why do I want? Well, the last person. There's only. Oh, I got n. Uh, I, so the, there's a first person who sat there determined. So I've forgotten about them, and this is everybody the second on. So, but I've indexed them from one through n. So there's n plus one total people. Yeah. Thank you. So. Um, so you look at that object there and you say, well, um, uh, as a function of n, you know, I'm getting some distribution here. That kind of looks like a moment, okay? It looks like a moment of some kind. So where, what moments are those? So if now if you return to DeFinetti, so let's remember DeFinetti was for any exchangeable sequence, um, I get this integral expression. So let's take the exchangeable sequence of these indicators. It's a pull urn, so they're, they're certainly exchangeable. And so by DeFinetti, the probability that the exchangeable sequence takes on particular values, I wrote that earlier as theta n a, and that'll be z is equal to a one or a zero. Those are the only possibilities in the Bernoulli case. So I can write this. Um, well, that's equal to, and then I had a product of the g of a i. Well, a i can only take on two values. You're either a zero or one, right? So that g entity is really just a single number. The probability that you're a one or probably you're a zero. Let's call that probability eta. So it's the probability of coming up heads, i.e. that you sat at the first table. And, so I'm, and now I'm saying that everybody sat at the first table. So the probability of that happening, given eta, is eta to the n. Okay, so that's the g, that's the product. The product became the, the exponent n, because they're all the same, uh, of the g's. That's, that's, in the binary case, that's what you get. And then we have a distribution on the eta. So let's just write that as, um, and so we, we put a distribution there uh, on DeFinetti. But now we're trying to get a specific set of moments. 
So let's guess a particular distribution there and see if we can recover those moments. So let's guess the beta, okay? Um, so uh, here's our guess. I just put in the beta. I'm going to write it as beta. There's a normalizing constant, which I'm going to call, normally it's alpha 1, alpha 2, but we kind of know where we're heading. That's, I'm going to put a 1 comma beta uh, alpha in there. I'm going to use a particular beta distribution because we have reasons to believe that beta 1 comma alpha is the right thing to use here. So I'll use it here. And so beta distribution, uh, remember, it's, you know, um, well, it's just, uh, uh, you know, eta to the uh, 1 minus 1 power 0, so I get a 1, that goes away. I'll just get the second term, the 1 minus eta uh, to the alpha minus 1 power and d eta. Okay, so that's suggested by DeFinetti with a particular guess for what the DeFinetti mixing measure might be. Okay, and now you don't have to do, do a lot of, know a lot of calculus to, you, you remember that's a, that's a gamma, you know, it's a ratio of gammas, you plug it in and you do this little integral and you get out exactly this. Okay, so this distribution here has a name. It's called the beta Bernoulli. It's a distribution. And it's gotten by taking the Bernoulli distribution and mixing it across an underlying beta. It's called the beta Bernoulli. It has certain heavier tails, um, you know, because of the mixing. And then you would get out of a pure Bernoulli. And that makes sense because a pure Bernoulli is that I told you the coin tossing probability was 0.3 or 0.5. Here we're randomizing over the coin tossing probability and getting a bunch of ones and zeros. So obviously we get more spread, heavier tails. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is equal. And that's a calculation you can do. Okay, so um, we have a, uh, um, um, a random variable that has, uh, uh, you know, a random, what's random here is, is this eta, and I chose a particular density for it. So this is the nth moment of eta. Just the expectation of eta to the nth power, that's the nth moment, right? And I'm saying I know all the moments, they all have this form. So if I know all the moments are random variable, I know the random variable. And so this random variable here has as its moments this, this uh, you know, beta Bernoulli. Okay, so that tells you that the probability of sitting at the first table or not is given by drawing from a beta one comma alpha. Okay, so that says that the probability associated with this thing is beta one comma alpha. All right, so that's the probability of sitting at the first table or not. All right, now let's take all the people who sat at the first table and forget about them. All right, and now think about the second table. So there was some first person who sat at the second table. Forget about that person and think about all the subsequent people. Either they sit at the second table or they don't. Okay, so the remaining probability, we've forgotten about this table, that has a certain probability, beta one comma alpha. Forget about that, break off the stick. The remaining probability, we're going to allocate either to sitting at the second table or not. And now the exact same argument goes through that that's a beta 1 comma alpha distribution. Right? And so that breaks off another part of the stick to allocate to this table. And then we get beta 1 comma alpha, beta 1 comma alpha. So we get stick breaking out of this argument. Okay? All right, so there's a little bit of sloppiness here about size bias sampling and ordering issues, but, I'm, I'm, but that basically is, is kind of the argument. Okay? So we're doing the moments. Uh, now you actually know how to work with some of the moments of these things, that if you like methods of moments, um, you know, these are the moments you would work with. If you would like to set them to empirical moments, that would be an interesting thing to do. Okay, so that's what I want to say about that. Um, okay, so uh, next step is what I want to focus most of my time on, which is this other arrow here. So let's say that we've now learned to construct a whole variety of these things with, say, heavier tails and other properties, and we're starting to get a little zoo of, um, of ways to choose these processes, can we, can we organize that zoo a little bit better? Um, okay, so um, why is this object called a Dirichlet process? Okay, so um, we've used that name, but we never, the Dirichlet distribution appeared at some point, but just once. Okay, and all this other GEM stuff, there's no Dirichlet sitting in there, there's a sequence of beta. So Tamara, I gave you some clue, but now here's a much more direct way to think about it. So here's this underlying space in which all the atoms are living with their weights. So let's carve up that space into regions A1, A2, you know, dot, 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 up to AK. So let's take a partition of the underlying space. Okay, we're putting a random measure on this space and I was drawing it, you know, with these little picket fence kind of diagrams earlier. Now we're in this two dimensional setting, but anyway, it's a bunch of atoms at certain locations with certain heights given by the GEM process. So that's a particular realization. If I do that again and again, I'll get a random variable associated with each of these K regions. So in fact, now I have a random vector 
GA1, GA2, dot, 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 GAK. That's just a collection of random values, uh, random variables. So it's a random vector. The infinity has gone away. All right, and so um, I assert that this, has a, this random vector has a distribution. All right, um, so these g's um, will all add up to one, okay? Because this object we got out of gm was a random, not just a random measure, it was a random probability measure. Okay, so this will all add up to one. Um, and they add up to one and they're non-negative. Hmm, what distribution do I know does that? Well, so this in fact is coming from a Dirichlet distribution. Our Dirichlet distribution had parameters alpha one, alpha two, up to alpha k, as Tamara was showing you. Where are, the, where are the alphas coming from this problem? Well, they are exactly um, the alpha literal parameter from the stick breaking times the g naught measure evaluated on the set. So that just gives you a number, and that scales it up. All right, and then I get alpha g naught a2 dot 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 alpha g naught a k. So those are just numbers. And you put them into a Dirichlet, and they derive some numbers which are random, and those are the marginal probabilities under the Dirichlet process. So the Dirichlet process has Dirichlet marginals, right? And again, the stochastic process here is indexed by, by sets. These are particular sets, so we're talking about marginals of the Dirichlet process, literally. Okay, so I'm going to prove this as a consequence of what we've been doing. Um, it turns out in the very first paper about the Dirichlet process, 1971 circa, this was the definition. Okay, it, it was an, and they used Kolmogorov argument. So it said, uh, assert that these are the finite dimensional distributions. Uh, therefore, by Kolmogorov, there exists an underlying process which we'll call the Dirichlet process. But it was very non-constructive, and in fact, it wasn't quite right. It was this thing didn't actually quite satisfy the Kolmogorov conditions. But that was the original paper. How did you get A1 Just partitioned. I partitioned some arbitrary way, and the definition is, is that if this holds for all partitions, then I have, by definition in the old days, a Dirichlet process. I'm going to show that if you partition this in any way, that this follows from our GEM. The Dirichlet process was the G, or what is it? Dirichlet process is the underlying stochastic process which has these things as marginals. I see. That's the it's some, yeah, it's indexed by collections of sets. And if you look at particular sets, they have a particular distribution, and that's the joint of those is Dirichlet. Yeah? But if you start with that definition, how do you actually show that there is a process which satisfies that? Kolmogorov. So Kolmogorov had a very, uh, I just have a bunch of consistent uh, finite dimensional distributions, plus a certain topological constraint, OK? And this has consistent marginals. Yeah, that's property of the Dirichlet distribution. If I collapse two of the cells, a k and a k minus one, these will add, and so they'll, they'll be consistent. Um, but it's this topological property that actually didn't work out for this process. And the first paper didn't get that quite right. Um, so later papers did this GEM construction, and that's clearly rigorous. You just need countably infinite number of pi variables and phi variables. That's that's clearly uh, defines a stochastic process. And then to show that it had Dirichlet marginals is not so hard. So that, that's a different way of getting at it. All right. So, um, okay. So let's try to, uh, what I'm really going to try to do now is, is define another object called a gamma process. And um, once you see how to define a gamma process, you'll see how to define all kinds of other stochastic processes. And they have all combinatorial sides to them. There's a whole zoo of combinatorics that will come out. And you'll start to see some of that. Um, so why are we going to define an object called a gamma process? Well, um, you all know what a gamma random variable is. It's kind of the statistical physics random variable. It goes up at some polynomial rate and then it decays exponentially, entropy versus energy. Um, so uh, that's one gamma random variable. If I have a collection of k ran gamma random variables, I'm going to have k numbers that are all non-negative. They will not sum to one, but they will sum to something finite. So divide and normalize those k random variables, and I get the Dirichlet. Okay, so that's an easy little calculation. Have you ever seen that? Uh, it's actually, in some sense, a definition of the Dirichlet. Take independent gammas, sum them up, um, divide. You get something that sums to 1, and that, that is the Dirichlet. Um, so if you want to get the Dirichlet actual density function, that's the way to get it. Um, OK, so uh, we might imagine then on a space like this, that we could define an object called a gamma process, which has gamma marginals. 
okay? I.e., if we look at any, uh, some other process, not, let's not call it G, if I look at you know, H, H of A1, H of A2, and H of A, I would get a bunch of gammas, and they would be independent. And if I can do that for any choice of A's, then I've defined a gamma process. Uh, and then when I divide, uh, I will get a Dirichlet process. Okay, so how do we define a gamma process? All right. Um, okay, so let's define a completely random measure now. So we're going to go right up to here um, and talk about this object called a completely random measure. Very natural if you're a computer scientist. So um, let's do this in one dimension so I can make my prettier drawing. So here's one of our picket fences. We've drawn um, a G from some thing, and not necessarily a Dirichlet process anymore, just some arbitrary thing, blah, blah, blah. OK? So, and now this, so this is now the space theta. It's a one dimensional. So let's divide it up into regions. You know, here's A1. A2, and let's make it a partition. We didn't have to in general, but let's make it a partition. A3, dot, dot, dot. OK, so now for each one of these um, regions, there'll be a certain random amount of mass falling into them under the uh, stochastic process for G. So G of AI is, in fact, a random variable. We talked about that before. All right, so now in general, if you look at GAI and GAJ, those are two random variables, will they be? Dependent, independent, well, but either. And under the Dirichlet process, uh, are they independent or dependent? <coughs> They're dependent, right? Because they have to sum to one. So they have a negative correlation. So if this is really big, because they have to sum to one, this will typically be smaller, a negative correlation. Right? But it's kind of a weak negative correlation. So you could imagine an interesting definition would be, let's define a stochastic process such that these are all independent of each other for all i and j. Okay, so the amount of mass that drops in here and here and here, it's all independent. So why would you want that? Well, because now if you're thinking about divide and conquer algorithms, if you've got independence in the prior, you can break the problem up on different processors and they can go about their Bayesian analysis merrily and put it all back together. So if you're a computer scientist, you know this would be a very natural first step is to find random measures which have, are completely random, CRM. Okay, so you know what a random measure is. It's a stochastic process on a sigma algebra. And now you know what completely means. It just means for any partition, I have independence. All right, so did there exist interesting completely random measures? Yeah, tons of them. So we're going to start to, to characterize them. Okay, so the first completely random measure you need to learn about is something called the Poisson random measure. Poisson random measure. All right, so everybody probably knows what a Poisson point process is. Right? Um, so what's Poisson point process? Okay. I'm not doing good board, I keep jumping around. But here's some space, theta. And um, a Poisson point process just drops, it's a set valued stochastic process. It just drops points in the space. Okay? And it does it in such a way that if you take any little cell here and you ask about the, the number of points in that thing, that number is a Poisson random variable. Okay, now the homogeneous Poisson process, there's a constant rate over the entire space, and so the Poisson I eventually get out has a constant rate lambda, uh, which would be lambda of, it'd actually be a, a measure, it'd be lambda, let's call it mu, that's what I'm going to call it later, mu of, the, if this is a little subset A, it'd be this, the measure, the Lebesgue measure of A. So the volume of A, I get more Poisson counts as I get a bigger volume. All right, but the counts are Poisson. Okay, and so I think all of you know how to construct these things, one way to do it is to, pick a total number of points out of a Poisson, call it n, and then given that, throw them uniformly uh, at random over the space. So that's a homogeneous Poisson process. So what's a non-homogeneous Poisson process? All right, well that's one where you have a, a, this, this mu function um, is not constant. It can vary over the space, okay? So I might have something kind of tilts in this direction where I have a bigger rate over here and a smaller rate over here. So then I would take, I would integrate mu, um, you know, dx over the set A, where this is some rate function, and I'd get a number that's an integral over, over the set of a function. And that, but that would now just give me a number, and then I'd put that into a Poisson distribution, 
and that would deliver a count associated with that region. And if my function is bigger in some regions, I'll tend to get more counts. So this is lots of real life data like this. There's lots of clustering over here, there's a city, here's this is the urban area. I would do that with a non-homogeneous Poisson. Okay, so uh, that's a Poisson point process. What's a Poisson random measure? Well, it's a different mathematical object. A Poisson point process is a stochastic process on sets, set valued process. Each realization is a set of points. Poisson random measure, a realization is a random measure. It's a measure, right? But it's easy to convert. So if we do this in one dimension, I could have a Poisson point process, maybe not homogeneous, which just gives me some x's, right? And it's all I need to do is to put a delta function above each one of them of height one, and I get a Poisson random measure. So it's just essentially the same mathematical object, but it's, it's, it's a measure instead of a set valued function. Okay? So if you were to write it, you would write g is equal to sum of delta functions at locations phi k, where these are chosen uniformly random, uh, or according to a rate function mu to make it cluster. And I'd sum that up k equals 0 to infinity. All I'm missing is the weights there, because they're all set to 1. Okay, so that's a Poisson random measure. Uh, one of my favorite books in probability, by the way, some of the students in the room, a Sinlar, Shinlar, at um, Princeton has a very nice book called Probability and Stochastics. And instead of using the kind of you know, Gaussian focused probability story that most books do, this is the Poisson focused probability story. And Poisson random measures play an incredibly important role in that book. Um, you define Brownian motions in terms of them and so on. And I think this is the right way to think about probability in the future, uh, you know, teaching text in the future. Is, uh, is, is, that's why I really like this is Aaron's similar book, Probability and Stochastics. Yeah? Um, so for the random measures, so the points are fixed and it's just the, like, kind of, uh, the weightage that you're it's all ran These are random. So these are chosen uh, either out of the uniform, if you're doing the homogeneous, or out of non-uniformly. And given those have been chosen, these are all random. Uh, the, these weights are fixed at one instead of being by the GM process. Okay? So as I keep drawing from this, I'm getting different configurations. But it's a, it's a measure. Because if I hit, you know, if I do, I can do talk about G of A, I just hit a delta of A, that'll be a zero, one, and I'll add them up. Okay, number, number of points falling in some set. Okay. Um, so is a Poisson random measure a completely random measure? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a theorem, but it's a kind of trivial theorem. If I partition this space up and I ask how many points fall in each region, well, it's Poisson. All right, and it's independent. That's a property of the Poisson process. In fact, it's a characterization of the Poisson process. It's the only counting process that has that property. Okay, so if I really was insisting on completely random measures, it's a characterization to have independence. How can I get beyond the Poisson? All right, so now you get this really amazing construction. Due to Kingman and Levy and other famous probabilists. All right, so let me get the good notation here. This comes out nicely. Um, actually, just to develop a little more notation here, I'm going to be calling Poisson random measures with an N instead of a G. So let's get rid of that A there. So that'll be N. It's a, it's a, N will be the symbol for a random measure that has atoms of F weight 1. Okay? Um, and so N of A is a random variable, which is indeed a Poisson, um, with some rate, which will be some measure mu of A. Okay, so that's, just, that's my notation. OK, so now CRMs, completely random measures. So what we're going to first do is um, form a product space. So we're going to take our underlying space we're trying to put a random measure on, and we're going to cross that with the reals plus. So here's the diagram. If this is the theta space, I'm going to add another dimension to my problem which is the reals, the positive reals, not negative reals. So I've got a two-dimensional space now, not a one, you know. So if this weren't one dimension, if this were a function space, for example, fine. You just add one dimension to your function space. I just can't draw it. OK. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a non-homogeneous Poisson process on the product space. So I'm going to throw down uh, some points on this thing. So, um, you know, here they are, maybe. And it's non-homogeneous, so I'm now going to make, try to make a drawing here. So here's maybe a rate function might look something like this. Bad drawer. But over that product space, there's a function, which if I integrate it, I get a number for any given little region. 
okay? So this particular one I had tilting up like that, so I'm gonna get more and more points down here. It'll be denser down here because there's a bigger rate, okay? All right, so from a, the Poisson process with a, so, so I'm gonna define a, um, a rate mu, um, which is a rate, it's a measure on um, R, and I'm gonna make that itself be a product measure. So it'll have a theta component, which I'll call G naught, and it'll be crossed with a component in that direction, which is called the levy measure, and I'm gonna call that eta. So this is the levy measure, and this is some arbitrary rate you put there, which is the same symbol we've been using for for the same reasons. And it's kind of degree of freedom for you as a probabilist or statistician. And I'm making this product measure on this space, this function I've drawn, uh, be, a, um, be a product. It didn't have to be, in this general theory, you, know, you don't have to have it be a product. But I'm treating this axis and this axis separately. Okay, so, um, right. So if I were to, you know, just apply this to a little rectangle uh, set here, you know, then I would have mu of, let's call it A cross E. You know, so that would be just G naught of A times um, eta of E. Okay, just a definition of a product measure. Okay, so from this, um, that this uh, Poisson uh, point process or random measure on this space, I get a bunch of atoms. So Poisson uh, PRM generates a whole infinite collection of atoms when I sample from it. Actually, it wouldn't have to be infinite, but um, it's going to be infinite because this thing is going to be infinite. Um, so what names do I give those atoms? They have two coordinates. So let's call them phi and w. We get a whole collection phi um, w. So the phi, uh, I might get a you know, phi one here and a w one here. So my first point I draw in the Poisson random measure is sitting right there, has coordinates phi and w, and then I start getting a whole bunch of them. So I have a whole collection of uh, two valued um, uh, vectors here. So that, that's, that's these x's that I'm drawing. All right, and now what I'm gonna do is, this is the key part of the construction, is I'm gonna drop a line from these points down to this axis and put little arrows there, if you will. And now, having doing so, I will be putting a random measure on this space and I'll forget the rest of the diagram. So I'll go back to my theta space. So to, to define that, I will now define a random measure G um, equals to, um, well, what does this mean? It means that I have an atom, a delta function, at location phi, and it's weighted by the height, which is a W value, the corresponding W value. K equals uh, one to infinity. Okay, everybody see that? From Poisson point process, I get a bunch of points spread around the space. It has two coordinates, all right? This, the first coordinate defines the location, and I put an atom there. And the second coordinate defines the height, I put a W there, and so I literally get this. Yeah? Uh, I could use some intuition of where this is going. So with the previous one, there was yeah. this clustering intuition. So what, yeah. what, is, what phenomenon is this? Yeah, so um, I, I think, just trust me a little bit longer uh, that the math is gonna lead us somewhere. Um, I, I can say the following, that Tamara is going to get into a lot of applications to random graphs and power laws and graphs and all that, and this will flow exactly out of this. Also, uh, we're going to, she may, we'll talk about feature models at some point. So um, what, one thing that's broken about the Chinese restaurant process for lots of applications is you come in and you have to sit at one table, right? Um, many of us want to sit at multiple tables, all right? In particular, what if the tables are uh, not clusters, they're like features? So the first one would be what language you speak. The second would be what kind of food you like, what kind of exercise you like. Well, I come in, you know, I speak English and Italian. Um, you know, I like these kinds of foods. So there's a whole checkbook, a little bit vector for everybody. That's called a feature model. Dirichlet process doesn't deliver that. It wants you to sit at one table. Something else called the beta process does deliver that. It allows you to sit at multiple tables. And the beta process will flow right out of this. Uh, so basically, each one of these atoms in the beta process will be a number between this, this space will actually end zero to one. These will be an infinite collection of coins with numbers between zero and one. So I, I draw, redraw this diagram. On the theta space, I will be getting an infinite collection of coins at certain locations that are between zero and one. You know, this might be 0 0.6, 0 0.3, or whatever. Uh, I'll draw from this process to get that object, and then I will toss those coins and get ones and zeros. That's called a Bernoulli process. And now I've got a bit vector for, for one person. And then I could do that again from this underlying object. I'm getting a beta Bernoulli in the process world. I'm getting an infinite vector for everybody's propensity to have a certain feature, you know, Italian versus English, and then you'll actually speak English or Italian when you do the Bernoulli. 
Okay. So it's again the D finity store where I draw an object, we could call this one G, and then I'll follow it further with another draw from that. So okay. now that theta is the space you're defining the feature. So theta is a feature space? Yeah, so theta would be the feature space. This space would be um, yeah, the attributes you can have, right? Attribute. Right. So what, this attribute here might does he speak Italian or not? Okay. And the probability uh, in this population of people, that's what I'm modeling with the underlying probabilities, is 0.6. So a particular individual might speak it or not. So that person then, after you draw from this, will have a one or a zero there. But that feature is the Italian or not feature. It has a probability. Right? And then another feature could be likes Chinese food or not, and so on. And I'll, so I'll end up getting out a bit vector. Right? And this, the, one of the magic of the things happening here is this bit vector will be infinite dimensional but it'll only have a small and finite number of ones. So it'll be a sparse vector. So here's how you get sparsity and sparse dictionaries and the Bayesian formalism is with this process. So does that help you a little more to kind of give you an indication of, yeah. Um, so this is an object here which is a random measure, but it's not a random probability measure. It doesn't integrate to one. If, if you make this integrate to one, then it's a random probability, you, then it's, you want to kind of pick one of the entries. You know, like you're sampling from a measure, you'll get one entry. That's the Chinese restaurant process where you sit at one table. If you don't make the thing sum to one, you sit at multiple tables. All right. And there's many other applications to, you know, survival, <coughs> probabilities, and all kinds of other things. But I'm just, okay, so hopefully that was helpful. But anyway, trust me a little bit more on the math for a second. Okay, so we've made a construction here um, by this, 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 and this. And now we have this object here, which is clearly a random measure. It has atoms, and they're all random, locations of random heights. Is it a completely random measure under this construction? What's the definition of completely random? If I partition my uh, space here, A1, A2, does the amount of mass falling into those A's, is that independent for all choices of A's? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes because? Because it's coming from a Poisson process. Yeah, because it's coming from a, it's not a Poisson process, but it's coming from dropping Poisson weights into these things. So the, you look at the amount of mass that could fall into the region A1, it's all the points that lie on that stripe. All right, well that stripe is independent of the next stripe over. You'd have to do a little more math to make this rigorous, but it's easy. Yeah? Sorry, how does theta represent features? Okay, theta is just some arbitrary feature of space. It could be, you know, word embeddings, if you will. It could be a vector space, Euclidean. I draw it as one dimensional, just so I can draw it. But imagine it's a vector space of some kind, okay? How does this allow you to have two features? Two features, okay, so, um, I was going to the case where uh, I then took a further draw, which was, which was um, uh, Bernoulli. Okay, so I'm either, either going to have the feature or not. And the feature, what it means to be a feature is that you're at a particular place in the theta space. So it's a zero feature? No, um, okay, so you can use the feature different ways here. I'm thinking of the feature as the underlying vector. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a, um, um, so let's suppose I have the Italian feature, okay? Then I'm gonna use that, I'm Amazon, I know you're Italian now. I'm gonna use that to make predictions about what kind of books you like, All right? So that book buying vector is, is the feature. Is that a that's theta. theta. That's, that's a point in theta. It's all of the things associated with that, that person, that, that kind of person, okay? An Italian person, say. But if features are distinct points, how can you have two of them at the same time? Uh, you can, so you put that into a statistical model. So I, I, uh, I told you this person speaks Italian and he lives in Berkeley. Okay, those are two things he can be. Right? Now in terms of his book buying behavior, that probably might means he buys some books about Italian, you know, or whatever. But he also simultaneously buys books about Berkeley. Right? And those are two maybe real valued vectors in this theta space. So I would put those two vectors in some way into a statistical model, Amazon does exactly this, to give a list of recommendations over certain kinds of books that are both Italian and, and, and Berkeley. So I'm not putting this person into a cluster where you just buy books like everyone else in that cluster. That was Amazon's original model, which didn't scale. The new model is that you can belong to simultaneously to multiple clusters, meaning that I got multiple vectors for you. Right? Now I could add them, that would be kind of a dumb thing to do, but you don't have to. Statistical models allow you to take those vectors and maybe switch between the two or, or whatever. Okay? because I thought the person, like, Stata was, like, a draw from this distribution, but it's not. Oh, that's, these, these spaces I'm calling them theta instead of x, 
person's the data. That would be the x. These are the parameters lighting up above that determine the further statistical model about the choices or whatever. Okay, so it's a little abstract, but um, hopefully that helps. Okay, so um, this construction indeed gives you completely random edges. I mean, they're, i.e., they're independent among the sets. Here's the remarkable fact, is that that is actually a characterization. This is the only way to get completely random measures. So it seemed like an exotic construction with this product space and this Poisson and all that. Uh, and what Kingman proved in a famous paper in 1967, a 10-page beautiful paper, is that this is actually if and only if. This is the only way to get completely random measures. Sorry. Yeah. If you look at the projection of the theta, is yeah. it a homogeneous uh, Poisson? What do you mean by projection of the theta? So you look at all the sets on uh, A1 to AK, yeah. partition over this axis. Yeah, and partitioning over this axis, that's right. right, yeah. And you look at the probability of A1. Uh, by, by all, it, what that means, it's all the points that drop into A1, weighted so, by their, so then their that weights. Is a Poisson. Um, yeah. The, the count would be a Poisson, right? But these, these masses, each one of the, it, it's our additive of these things. I now have these right, weights so here. Earth, okay. Yeah. Right, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a real, no, it's a real number now. It's not a, yeah. yeah. So there's these weighted atoms falling there. I'm adding up the total weights right. associated with those atoms. That's a total mass. But it's independent among the stripes, so therefore it's completely random. And the, the amazing fact is it goes the other way. So now if you believe this, uh, at this point, um, then the whole problem reduces to this specification of this levy measure. That's what gives you the different completely random measures. It's the, uh, the rate measure. Okay, so the statistician or probabilist says, okay, I'm in a brand new problem. I want to use completely random measures. I, my degree of freedom is right there. Your hand goes up first. Yeah. Uh, is there any intuition behind why this is the only way to get Yeah, there is. I think I don't want to get into it. If you, uh, Kingman has a beautiful book on the Poisson process. That's a weekend read. It's this little thin book, and it's just totally beautiful. And in there, you will get that intuition. But you'll have to study. You'll have to think about it a little bit. Uh, basically, there's many characterizations of the Poisson process, and there's a, the, the, the most beautiful one is the most spare one. It doesn't, you're not making almost any assumptions, but it's Poisson. And that same kind of intuition happens here. Independence and Poisson are quite, quite closely allied. But this is not Poisson. It's, it's, it's taken from a Poisson. Is there another? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so in this case, you just have to factorize across theta and r, or? I factorized yeah. it here. So, so for this yeah. You don't have to do this for the general theory. I'm doing this to simplify. So you still get it. Yeah, you still get this. That's right. That's right. Yeah. OK, so let me try to move on, because I do want to get a little further. So um, all right, so um, that theorem, you can, it's 12 pages. You can read it. It's, it's, it's interesting and not that hard. Let's try to use this for something. Let's define a particular completely random measure. We haven't done that yet. So, let's, um, so to do that, we have to pick our G0 and our eta. Uh, this, let's just pick to be uniform. It doesn't change anything. It just changes where the atoms are, and that's not important to us. It's really the, the, the combinatorics of the heights of these atoms that matters, and that's determined by the Levy measure. Uh, Levy, by the way, was another Berkeley famous person who was here for many, many years, and he defined what are called Levy processes, which are Brownian motions plus jumps, high, widely used in finance, and he was the origin of this. Sometimes what we're doing is, instead, if we stretch ourselves to one dimension, we would be doing Levy processes. We're allowing ourselves to be an arbitrary function space where these atoms live, so we're beyond classical Levy. Um, so, um, ba -ba -ba -ba. gamma process. So let's define now a very important process in statistical physics and in um, the genetics called the gamma process. So to define these, pro it is an example of a CRM. All we have to tell you is what is eta. So um, why did I call it suddenly start calling it mu? I'm going to call it eta. All right, so eta is a, no, no, mu. I'm, okay, good, good. I see. So let's call it, mu has two parts to it. Um, so let's now, we're going to be talking about doing integrals. So let's uh, write this in kind of suggestive integral notation. Um, the first part is just G naught. So you know, we can integrate against G, G naught, fine. What's the other part? This is the important part. Well, it's going to be alpha times W minus 1 times E to the minus beta W times DW. So it has a density. There it is. Um, it's not just an arbitrary measure. It's a, it's a, it has a density relative to the Lebesgue measure. So this is the second component right here. The first component is here. Okay. Um, 
All right, so what is this? Well, this should look familiar to you. That is the gamma form. It's a polynomial growth uh, killed off by an exponential tail. All right. Now, normally you would have an alpha here to get a gamma distribution, and this thing would integrate to a, you know, a gamma function that you normalize. There is no alpha here, it's a zero. So this thing actually integrates to infinity. Okay, fine, you can have a measure of a space be infinite. And in fact, that's exactly what you want. If this was a non-zero there, then this thing would integrate to something finite. The underlying rate measure would have a total finite mass, and the number of atoms I would get out would be finite. I don't want finite numbers of atoms. I'm getting infinite sums in this whole formalism. That's what Timer was talking about. To get infinite sums, I need some part of the mass to generate infinite numbers of atoms. And that's exactly where it's happening. The missing alpha here is where it happens. Okay, so that's a well-defined um, you know, rate function. It happens to you know, be infinite if I go over the entire space in the r direction. Perfectly fine. Uh, Mike, Mike, could you define it in words again? Sorry. It's Sorry? Could in you words? define it in words again? That Okay, I've just done, I, I don't know if you're used to this kind of de, uh, notation, you're not so used to it. I'm just, when I have a measure, why, why do you define measures? So you can integrate with respect to them. That's the whole point of having measures, right? So when I integrate with respect to a measure, you know, I write something like, you know, if I have a probability, a measure P, um, and I want to integrate with respect to it, it doesn't necessarily have a density, so I would write that as, you know, some function f of x, P dx, or dpx, however you prefer it. That's the general Lebesgue integral kind of way of writing it, you know, so, um, this symbol doesn't really mean anything. Uh, there's no notion of differential. It just means that you integrate with respect to p. Okay? So when I write a measure and I put a little dx there, I just say, oh, when you get ready to do the integral, you know, you're going to write it this way. So when I get ready to do an integral with respect to this product measure, you know, I'm going to give you little arguments here. Those are things I'll use inside the integral as dummy variables. So I'm suggesting those dummy variables here. And I did that because this particular, this eta part right here, this is eta. It's a measure. Um, you know, eta of dw. This one is not just an arbitrary measure, it has structure, it has a density. Not all measures have a density, this one does. There's its density. And you can plot this density, it looks like, you know, that. Okay. Actually, it doesn't look like that. It looks like that. It has a singularity here because of that. Gamma process is a special case? Or? Gamma process is a special case, it's general formalism. General formalism, you put an arbitrary thing here, yeah. and an arbitrary thing here. This is not so important, so I'm just leaving it as G naught. I'm putting a special choice here, this. And that defines the gamma process, because this is a gamma looking like density. That's why it's called the gamma process. That's one reason it's called the gamma process, but that's not the only reason. W ranges of all positive reals, so? Gamma what, sorry? W ranges of all positive Yeah, over the whole reals. This is, this is, this is you know, R plus, here's the Ws. No, it's not going up to one, like the, uh, the beta process I alluded to. Okay, so um, good. So we now, um, we, our notation is going to be, uh, we're going to draw from a gamma process with parameters um, alpha, beta, and G naught. Um, and that's going to deliver these, these picket fence kind of objects, but a different kind than we were talking about this morning. Uh, and the construction is literally the one I just went through here. Once I told you G naught, and I told you beta, and I told you alpha, this whole measure is specified, therefore I've got this, therefore I put it into the Poisson process, and I drop these things down and add them up, and I've got a draw. And I can do that again and again and again. Okay, so why are we doing this? Well, you know, well, many reasons, but um, um, so I argued earlier to get to the Dirichlet distribution, you can go through it by getting gammas. I, if I get some, uh, some independent gammas and normalize them, I get the Dirichlet. Well, I'm telling you how to get independent gammas now uh, because I have independence by the completely randomness property. And now all I gotta show you is this weird construction here gives me marginals that are themselves individually gamma. So I need to now show you that G, drawn in this way, applied to any particular set is gamma. Does classical gamma out of your elementary textbooks with some parameter A and B okay, to be specified. Right, if I can do that, because they're independent, I've got an independent collection of gammas, I could normalize them and, get, and define a Dirichlet process. Right? And then this whole toolbox could be done to define all kinds of other objects that aren't gamma, that aren't gamma or Dirichlet. And then, in fact, there's a whole bestiary of them. Negative binomial processes and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the last part, 
how do you show that something has gamma marginals? All right. Um, let's start erasing. OK, so I, I claim that a certain random variable has a certain distribution. That this GA constructed in this complicated way, and let's just now call it A8, not AI. It, it's a certain random variable um, that it has a certain distribution. Right. Well, uh, how do I verify that something has a certified, something has a certain distribution? Um, well, I could just try to calculate bare hands. That's impossible here. Um, or I could start checking its moments. Okay. And if its moments are matching up to the ones I think they are, they're starting to look good. And if I do the whole collection of moments and they all match up, that's what I did before. Right. Another way to do that all at once is to do the moment generating function. All right. Um, so uh, you need a, the, uh, now you need a mathematical tool, which uh, you may not may not have acquired in your life, but you need to. Um, is um, how do you calculate moment generating functions of stochastic processes? So you all know about moment generating functions of random variables. Uh, what's the moment generating function of a stochastic process? Well, that is called the Levy-Kenshin theorem. Um, so Levy-Kenshin theorem. So uh, I will probably run out of time, but I'm actually in some sense going to prove the Levy-Kenshin theorem here for you. Uh, it's not that hard, and, and it's really worthy of knowing about. It's a very, it's, if you're a probabilist, this is like, you know, uh, everything, every day. You use this all the time. So, um, so and, and it will deliver the fact that this marginal distribution is gamma. Okay, so, so uh, maybe to work up to this, actually, I think it will finish in 10 minutes. So, um, you know, if this random variable is gamma, you know, the gamma, let's write down the gamma in general. So the gamma in general, um, let me use another variable. That's, it's, you know, there's a, uh, what, beta to the alpha, let's not use beta, B, B, A. B to the A over gamma A. A, A minus one, Z to the minus B, 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 Z. Now what am I doing? E. All right, there's the gamma density in general. Um, has two parameters, you know, so this is gamma A, B. And the mean, uh, if this is, you know, uh, some random variable, let's call it X, the expectation of x is just equal to a over b. And there's a variance formula which has a squares and b squares in it. I forget it. Okay? So you can just calculate moments by doing integrals against this density and get all these things. So in particular, if this object is actually gamma, then its expectation should be some a divided by some b. So let's see if we can calculate the expectation of this. All right? This is already going to be interesting. Um, okay, so what is g of a? Um, well, it's just the definition is that I add up these weighted things, phi k, uh, I apply that to A. All right. Um, now, I'm going to write this in a nice way. As if you're a probabilist, this is the first thing you do. You get rid of sums, you write integrals. So I'm going to write this as W times the indicator of A, um, phi. And then I'm going to use my measure as my measure to integrate against the counting measure. Because when you use counting measures for integrals, you get sums. So what counting measure? Well, that thing in that I told you about, the Poisson thing. So d theta dw. Okay? So what this says is that um, you just take this underlying Poisson points in the space, all right, and you add up in the, the phi direction if you fall in the set A. So that gets all the points that fall into the set A. And then you add up their weights under this Poisson thing um, here. Okay, so this is just this is a, this is a Poisson, so its weights are all one, and I multiply it by W to get the actual weights in the completely random measure. So this is just another way of writing this. This is a clean way to write this. Okay, um, so our um, object that we're trying to integrate here is now more abstractly. It's just some function of f of phi and W integrated against a um, random uh, a measure. So we're doing real stochastic processes now. We're taking an integral of a function against a random measure. So this whole object is just a number for each n, but n is random, so this is a random variable. Okay. All right, so even more abstractly to get rid of the phi and w, let's just call those together psi. Let's just call psi equal phi and w. Um, and so now my integrals I'm, are, I'm forming are of the form some function of psi and then some, um, some measure, which is random. So there's the kind of object I'm trying to work with for a particular choice of f and a particular choice of n. Okay, so now um, let's calculate. So uh, now we're going to do real measure theory. 
we're going to say, can I get formulas for this for the particular choice of a Poisson random measure? So uh, we had to do this over all Fs. So let's start with the indicators of sets. And then let's add up the indicators of sets to get step functions. And then let's use monotone convergence theorem to, to wave our hands. Okay? So our first kind of F then would just be um, F is of the form uh, just some constant C times an indicator of a set C psi. Okay? So it, on some set C, it takes the value C and it's zero everywhere else. So that's a particular F. Okay? And so now if we just calculate with that F, the expectation of this random variable, so I have an expectation of that random variable, um, it's just the expectation of plugging in my C indicator of C psi n d psi. Um, that's just equal to uh, integral of an indicator, it's just a probability. Okay, and uh, the C will come outside of the expectation. So I get C expected value of, um, of what? Well, it's the um, uh, measure of the set C. When I indicate it, you know, I use a measure uh, or a, over an indicator, I just get the measure of the set C. What is the measure of set C? It's just N of C, because N is a random measure. So now I have the expectation of this random variable, but that's Poisson. Okay, so N of C is Poisson with a rate which is the underlying mu function. So this is C mu C. Okay, moving along. Let's now do it for sums of indicators. Um, so F of psi of the form sum of uh, CJ indicator big CJ psi. Same story, had expectation of that integral right here, um, whatever, this. Um, all right, so it's just expectation of, um, I think I can kind of just skip steps. You guys can do this kind of algebra. So, um, right. Uh, Indicator, so it's going to be the expectation of a sum of um, CJ indicator psi n d psi. Sums will come outside, um, as is with the CJ. Um, then I will have the same thing I did before. It'll be the expectation of n of uh, C capital CJ, and. Um, that's then mu of CJ, so it's the sum of CJ mu of CJ, and that is just the, the integral, the Leblague integral um, of um, uh, F under the measure mu. Okay? I'm just adding up the measure of a set times the value of the set. That's just the definition of the integral. You know, it's a Riemann integral. Sorry, what's F here? It's uh, uh, this. It's a step function kind of. It's, 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 Sorry? What's the mu here? Um, uh, mu is the underlying whatever it is. It's the underlying um, G naught cross eta. And eta. C is a space in. What is C? C is a. Why don't we take this offline, okay? I, 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 I want to keep moving. I think I'm not to finish. Um, yeah, mu is the, I mean, it's the symbol I used before of, you know, mu is G naught cross eta. Are you helping him? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so look what happened, and this is quite cool. Uh, we were trying to take, this is a random quantity here. We're taking an integral of a deterministic function against a stochastic process. If we want its expectation, we should just get a number. And the amazing thing is the way you get the number is you take that same integral, that same function, against a deterministic measure, which is the rate measure for n. So you replaced n with mu, all right? So that's pretty amazing. So now levy kinchin which I'm not going to actually derive, but I can, it's almost the exact same steps. I'm going to write down the answer, however. Um, leave it as an exercise for you to do it. Okay, so, you know, moment generating functions, right? We all know and love them, things like that. Um, so um, how do we do that for stochastic processes? Uh, maybe we'll put a minus there. Let's put a T, because I'm using T in this. So let's do a, lo a plus transform. So, you know, how do you do that? Um, well, if that's just a random variable, you know, we don't know all kinds of tools. But what if it's a stochastic process? Now I've got e to the minus T integral of some arbitrary function 
um, of nd psi. That's the kind. That's the random variable I care about. I'm putting that random variable into a Laplace transform setting. All right. So can I do those kind of calculations? Um, all right. So, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, so how do you do this? You do exactly what I did there. You take start with F, Fs, which are indicators of particular sets. You plug it in. You do a little calculus. Then you do it with step functions. You plug it in. And then you uh, get, will get an answer. In fact, I didn't say this here, but this is now true for arbitrary f because of monotone convergence theorem. Okay, so I would do the same thing here, and I'll let you go through the steps. I really do encourage you to do them. You will get out the levy kenshin theorem, which is one of the pinnacles of uh, classical probability theory. Uh, here it is. So this is a Laplace transform of a object defined by integrating against the underlying stochastic process. The kind of thing we want to do is Bayesians all the time. Take an underlying stochastic process, find an integral, a marginal, find its distribution. Okay? And so if we can do this for all t and get an answer and compare it to some known result, and they're the same by uniqueness of you know, Laplace transforms, we're done. All right? And look at this for a second. What happened is that up in this expression, it was random, and the randomness is coming in here. N's a random measure, so we're getting a random integral. And what's happened here is that N's gotten replaced by a mu, so it becomes deterministic, and that's the rate function of N, but a little more complicated. Instead of just having F, we get 1 minus T to the E minus T. A little more complicated. So anybody know why that happened? Is that a familiar, is this familiar to anybody, this object right here, from something you work on? It's an MGF of a Poisson, okay? So in this calculation right here, the fact that this object is not just has an expected value, it has a distribution, which is Poisson has to come through somehow, and it comes through that you'll need the MGF of the Poisson along the way, and that's what this is. So you're integrating the MGF of a Poisson. All right, so this is really cool. This is a simple integral that you can do in many, many situations. And um, so again, there's an interesting, and so now let's go back to our, and I won't, we're, we'll close up in a couple of minutes, but let me just um, tell you where the next part of the story goes. Um, yeah, so let's now return to our Gaussian, uh, not our Gaussian, our gamma process. Um, so we now have this new, this is the, the Levy-Kenshin theorem. Um, and so if we want to now go back to this, and now plug in a specific stochastic process marginal, you know, uh, gamma process applied to a set A, um, you know, then remember my definition of that. Um, that is uh, expectation E. Um, I'm going to go ahead and write it out. So it's, a, it's an integral over the theta part because there's this product space. It has two pieces. And over the reals. Um, and then it has this 1 minus e to the t minus t. And then f for us is, is back in the gamma process was an indicator function, w times the indicator of a, phi. Bang. Um, and then g naught d phi. Here's our eta part. And then the, uh, um, the specific choice of the gamma. So bang, bang. OK, so I put in my little gamma integral here and my g here. That was a print. Uh, integrated against this thing right here, and that's that's exactly what this is. Okay, and now you stick in right here exactly that you know thing I wrote up before, which is alpha w to the minus one e to the minus beta duh, dw. Throw that in there, and now you have an integral that you could give to an undergrad. It's just an integral. Okay, calculus class. All right, and um, I'm not going to. Yeah. So here here at the core, I'll, be, I'll skip a couple of steps, and and here's what you get near the end. It becomes um, Alpha g naught of a, so that's just a number, no big deal. And here's the chord that you have to do. 1 minus e to the minus tw integrated against w minus 1 uh, e to the minus beta w dw. OK? Um, I puzzled on a whole airline ride across the Atlantic on how to do that stupid integral. And I couldn't get onto Wikipedia. And even when I got into Wikipedia, I couldn't find it. All right? And I thought integration by parts. I started hitting with this everything I knew. 
and I couldn't get it to come out. And it turns out it's a special integral that was studied in the 1800s by a bunch of Italians. And they have a whole huge theory about these kind of integrals. And they have very interesting properties, and so I've learned how to do them now. And I will challenge you to find it. It's not that hard, but it's a trick, as there often is with integration, and you can do it. Um, so fun exercise over the break, or tonight. And after you do that integral, amazing thing happens. You get the result beta over beta plus t to the alpha g naught a power. All right. My lecture ends here because that I recognize as a probabilist. That is the moment generating function of a gamma distribution. Okay. Moment generating function of a gamma distribution. I wrote it the gamma at some point. As in general, is b over a plus b, uh, or no, sorry, um, b plus t to the a power. Okay, you can do that calculation yourself. So we've learned that we have a gamma moment generating function. Therefore, g of a must be gamma. They're independent because it's completely random. Therefore, I can normalize them and I can get the Dirichlet process. Okay. All right. So um, you know that's a bunch of calculations, but you know you learned about the Levy-Kinchin theorem, and I hope you saw that there's a pretty general, interesting mathematical structure here. And the fact that this structure inside of it has all the kind of Chinese restaurant process and pull urine is really quite interesting and amazing. And it can all be understood and explained at some point as you start to study this topic. Um, you know, so, um, all right, and now uh, haven't we done that? We've done that for the gamma. And if we wanted to put in other, uh, design other stochastic processes, here's our design tool. We'd replace that with something else. So the beta has the form uh, the beta process has the form you know, w minus 1, 1 minus w to the a minus 1 dw. Um, and now there's a whole huge literature on other choices. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop there, um, see if there are questions. I haven't heard questions for a while because I've been shutting them down. So we have a couple minutes for questions and we'll take a break. And then Tamara is going to do the last hour. I'm going to have to leave about part way through because there's a job talk to go to. But um, So if you want to talk to me, I'll be here in the break. Um, and Tamara is going to go into random graphs, really, exchangeability, edge exchangeability, vertex exchangeability of graphs. And so these themes will come back in a, in a kind of, a, in some way, a richer, con more concrete context. Are there any questions? All right.